Welcome back to the W.M. Briggs Show. This week we're going to talk about scientism, psychology, impact factors, science's culture and dogma, peer review, and other things. And talking about the deleterious effect of science on our culture. And you can trust me, because I'm a scientist. Stick around. And then I cited, for example, the Big Bang Theory. Whoa. This is the number one show on television in any genre. And it's got scientists, young, and though they be caricatures, their dialogue is real. That show has a PhD physicist as, an, as a retained advisor to it. The, the whiteboards in the back have equations on them, change for each show, and what's on each board is relevant to the subject matter of each show. This is a show that is delivering science to you and is not even apologetic about it. Now, the first thing to notice about that clip of an interview with our celebrity scientist of the moment, Neil deGrasse Tyson, on the National Geographic channel, was the appalling, abominable music that they had to plaster into the background. Why they couldn't have taken his words unaccompanied by lousy music is uh, a separate question entirely. Beyond that, the interesting thing was the reverence that Tyson wants you to have, you the listener to have, the viewer of this show, this uh, Big Bang show, which I've never seen, the, uh, the reverence for science. My God, there are equations on blackboards in the background, genuine mathematical equations, which for the vast majority uh, are absolutely mysterious. These things are not meant to be taken seriously. The viewers are not going to be viewing these equations and trying to work them out for themselves, trying to find the deeper meaning behind these equations. No, it's nothing like that. You're meant to look at this stuff and find them wondrous. You're meant to think of science as something far above us, far, far beyond. This is the ultimate in reality uh, for many people. This leads to the doctrine of scientism. This leads to psychology, which we're going to talk about in a moment. What I'm very interested in today is the effects of taking too seriously science. Science has a place. Science is very nice. Science can do very many things for us through technology. But science is absolutely, positively, definitely not the be-all and end-all of human endeavors. In fact, that we see it is, is a huge and growing problem. So here is one thing, one problem right here, uh, encased in this next clip. See if you can figure out what this guy does and what he means. If you want to get serious about it, these guys uh, claiming that the snow in Washington disproves climate change are, are almost unpatriotic. It's, it's really, it, they're denying science. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it shakes me up. It's, and you say, using the term unpatriotic and saying that it's sort of defying science, do you feel like there is a legitimate, a legitimate beef about the facts here, honestly? Or do you feel like some people just don't like what the facts say? Well, my thinking is, really, I've thought about this a lot as an educator. I've spent a lot of time with a lot of people. It's, it's mostly generational. Uh, it seems to be. This is anecdotal for me. Older people just have a much harder time grasping the idea that you have many billions of people on the planet with a very, very thin atmosphere, you're able to affect its climate. It's as you, when you younger people are able to sort of embrace it. Well, leave aside the question of global warming. That was, of course, Bill Nye, the bow tie guy. And some fascinating things about that. What he said was critics of a particular scientific theory, which he embraced, were called uh, deniers, denying science. This is, uh, to him anyway, a form of heresy. Science is the ultimate to him, and the science that is the ultimate is that which has been defined by the consensus, the consensus of government, uh, activists, people with money. 
the universities, that kind of thing. What they say goes, what they define as science for him becomes capital S science, and that which cannot be denied. It would be like denying God to a theist. It, it is absolutely unfathomable to him that anybody could deny science. He's completely and honestly genuine about this. This is not something he's doing as uh, for himself anyway, propaganda, although many people do use global warming for propaganda purposes. He does not. He is a believer, a true believer. For him, science, capital S, science has spoken. And therefore, you can only listen. There's nothing else to do but listen, to worship, to take what is told to you and act on that alone and to not question it, to hold it without reservation, to have complete and utter faith. That is the form of science that leads to scientism. And what's interesting about this, if you listen carefully, he, I, I kept a bit in about the, the intergenerational changes. Uh, what was very clear to him and to me, I agree completely with Nye here, is that the young are much more manipulable than the old. The old still belong, many of us, to the culture in which science was not regnant, in which science was not the ultimate, in which the humanities, uh, literature, art, music, uh, and so forth, were just as important as science. Religion was as important as science. Philosophy as important as science. And these things have been given up in the mad rush to science because of the prestige in which science is, uh, is given, is seen. And this leads to scientists as our modern clerics. And the problem is... Uh, what, what can happen when the clerics are in charge of a culture is clericalism, in which everything has to be filtered through the view of the clerics. And this was rightly seen in, in medieval times as a problem in the church, actual cleric, clericalism of, of priests who had insinuated themselves in all aspects of society. And this grated upon people. And the same thing is happening here. A another problem was simony, which was the paying off of uh, for religious offices and so forth. So we'll talk about that when we come to grants. There is an analogy there too. But meanwhile, I want to talk about scientism. The belief, the false belief that science is the answer to all questions. And here is a clip uh, or possibly two clips I'll play from Roger Scruton on a speech on what is scientism. But scientism, as I understand it, is the pretense of scientific method uh, when considering a question that is, is not scientific. Uh, and we've got our culture today is, is full of these pretenses. Uh, you only have to open an ordinary Sunday uh, newspaper supplement and you'll find some expert on the theory of evolution applying that theory to the explanation of some, uh, some human trait or, or other. For instance, um, sexuality, which is constantly coming under the microscope of the evolutionary psychologists. You, you know, um, the evolutionary psychologists might come up with the explanation of monogamy, as a, which is, seems to be um, a kind of norm in human behavior, by saying it is an adaptation. Now, this is not just a question of passing illegitimately from an is to an ought. Uh, uh, which is something which philosophers are quite familiar with, but there is there is such a thing as illegitimately passing from an explanation of something to the meaning of something. And that right there is the real problem. When scientists think that they can write down an equation for a thing, they think they've explained the thing. And we talked about this last week in our, our podcast about multiverses and infinities and so forth. Just because you can derive an equation and the equation is somehow internally consistent and you can prove it, does not mean that equation fits the thing which the scientist says it fits. So that you could have these theories of inclusive fitness, which is a big thing in uh, evolutionary psychology and other forms of fitness, and these equations work out and they're very nice, but that doesn't mean they have the slightest bearing to reality. 
Um, they're satisfied when the, the scientists are, when the equations do work out. And that's enough for them. They don't actually test these theories uh, anymore as they used to. Science used to be, this is part of the problem, science used to be the uh, art of coming up with an explanation for a phenomena and an understanding of that phenomena. We're not passing to the understanding part anymore. We're satisfied with the explanation part. And that's the, and we're not even satisfied with that so much anymore because the explanation part involves making predictions and then testing those predictions. Even that part has been thrown out in a lot of sciences. It's not just global warming, which we often talk about. Uh, the, the forecasts are made in global warming, and they're lousy. They stink. There, there really are uh, abysmal forecasts. But nobody cares because the theory is more important. The theory seems to explain more of a human behavior than of the atmosphere. And that's what's really wanted in global warming theory, uh, the theory of human behavior, of fossil fuel use, and that sort of thing. This is why it's become quite a thing for activists and politicians and other things to latch onto. Not because of the physical theory. None of these people understand it. These people don't know the first thing. You ask any one of them to, to define vorticity, for instance, or what the convective available potential energy is, and they wouldn't have a clue. They don't understand the real science behind this at all. And that real science, uh, you know, t t speaking of CAPE, for instance, this is an attempt not just to explain things, but to understand how the atmosphere works. So that's the old way of viewing things that we're sort of lacking. And it's not just global warming. As uh, Scruton said, the uh, evolutionary psychology, for instance, is loaded with these things, explanation after explanation, to, almost always to define our sexual behavior, and usually in a direction of uh, li libertinism. Uh, whatever you want to do is quite okay and has an evolutionary psychological explanation that somehow is going to increase your fitness, when it's just preposterous. I mean, uh, think about the many common ways now people do anything they can to avoid reproducing, which is quite against all of these theories. Uh, there's birth control, for instance, uh, adoption, um, abortion, <laughs> becoming a doctor, becoming a priest, becoming uh, anything that uh, involves a monk, for instance, anything that takes you away from your sexual reproductiveness and moves you to, towards uh, something that centers on self. This is not explained by any of these evolutionary psychological uh, uh, theories, which always tend to speak about fitness and so forth. So again, what they're trying to do is move to uh, an internally coherent system of explanation, but they're not matching this explanation to the world. And they're not certainly moving to understanding, which is the real uh, part of science that we're losing. Uh, we're moving towards this idea where the equation is everything. And the, and the idea of essence, of nature itself, of a human nature, for instance, or of a nature of a squirrel, or all of these things that used to be classically thought of are completely disappearing. So here again is Scruton on this question. And uh, take a listen to this, see what you think. What I would say is that scientism is really a kind of magic. It's a reversion to a pre-scientific way of thinking. It's that it involves using science to conjure things, to reassemble human life in order to exert a kind of control over it. The neuro, the neuro art historian is trying to assert a kind of control over this complex area of human experience uh, which will give him a superior credentials from the rest of us who merely understand it. Uh, you know, he can explain it and explain it in terms of the, its neurological base. But genuine scientific thinking, in my view, begins from independently defined problems and sets out to solve them. It doesn't begin from a theory which is then used as a, a, as a, a magic wand in order to redefine the whole area of study. Yeah, this is an enormous area. Uh we all are, he echoed the theme that we're moving away from understanding. It's just a, a form of magic. Once the, ex, the equations are down on paper, and science is measurement, so that part's, not, uh, that part's not the screwy part. Scientists should quantify what they're doing. There's no question about that, but it's when we move into quantifying the unquantifiable that the problem begins. 
And uh, Scruton earlier in this talk uh, emphasizes the neuro uh, marketing, the neuro uh, criminality, the neuro the neuro attached to so many different things. With these scientists who run off with their electronic phrenology devices, these uh, fMRIs, magnetic resonance imaging machines, and say, aha, look at this area of the brain that is lighting up. That's associated with feel feelings of uh, death and dread. And how do they know that? Well, because this is the area of the brain that lit up when they asked him questions about death. and On and on. These things that uh, purport to explain that t that say the brain is, is responsible for all of these things and this is a a huge problem with science they're trying to do too much they don't understand that there's a person behind uh, the neurons and they say the neurons are everything and this is the problem of scientism scientism asking questions it has no business asking uh and and it cannot possibly answer Science cannot tell you why murder is wrong or why theft is wrong. It can try to put it down in some equation. Well, you know, murder is bad for the genes. It doesn't uh, let genes propagate and so forth. Well, that's not entirely true, is it? I mean, you can murder your competition and steal, uh, steal his women and pass on your genes in that way. So isn't that a better thing? So science is absolutely useless to ask these questions and it cannot answer them but when it supplies answers to them and pretends that these are the answers because they're mathematical explanations we have moved into scientism and that's one big problem a another big problem is that science scientists form these little cliques these little cultures which somehow become immune to criticism so what led me to this particular podcast is I was uh, looking at the journal Medical Ethics. We've looked at this journal many times. Yet another asinine article uh, in Medical Ethics, which I'll uh, come to another time. But what struck me, this is a British medical journal. On the webpage for this article, in purple, great big image, said this words. It said, impact factor of this journal, impact factor, 1.511. Not 1.512 or 1.510, but 1.510. Think about that, friends. 1.511. What is an impact factor? Well, this is another pseudo quantification. This is a way of scientists to ensure there is no deviation from what they have as a norm. An impact factor is looking at the number of times a journal is cited in other journals that have won a special badge over the number of times, uh, number of articles or something like this. It's a silly, absolutely asinine quantification. And it's used as a sort of um, signal to other scientists that I am uh, um, among the elite. And how do I define the elite? By, well, it's self-referential, by having those journals which are highly cited. And people end up citing each other because the journals are thought worthy of citation. And so this all makes them, uh, you know, it leads to the idea that scientists become almost immune to criticism from the outside, and they react violently to criticism uh, to the outside. And as proof of this, I'm going to play a little clip from David Berlinski, who speaks on this subject of scientists and criticism. The idea that uh, science is a uniquely self-critical institution is, of course, preposterous. Scientists are no more self-critical than anyone else. They hate to be criticized, and they never criticize themselves. Um, given given the, the, the enormously long span of human history, this is um, a prediction that one would expect to be true, and it is true. Uh, there are local mechanisms of criticism in science. I mean, within established theories, if somebody publishes data that um, don't work out in the right way or if there are mathematical flaws in a certain theory, uh, these tend to get known. But large global criticisms of the scientific enterprise are very, very difficult to find and uh, certainly are not being promulgated by the scientists themselves with any great ebullience or enthusiasm. Look, these people are only human. They hate criticism. Me too. Me too. It's not a surprise. Um, the idea that scientists are absolutely eager to be beaten up, that's one of the myths. 
uh, put out by the scientists, and it works splendidly so that they can avoid criticism. Yes, you've all heard this. Show me the peer-reviewed article. Show me the peer-reviewed article. People screaming about peer review as if it's somehow wonderful. And if you show them a peer-reviewed article, they'll say, ah, oh, that journal doesn't have a high impact factor. And what's a journal with a high impact factor? Why, one that is right in the central part of the thing that you're criticizing. So it becomes a self-referential system. And it's, there's no way around it. It used to be in universities professors employed administrators to work for them. But now it's completely the other way around. Administrators hire professors to work for them, and the administrators haven't any idea what people are doing uh, or the usefulness uh, of the science put out by the various groups. They only can measure two things. They can measure the amount of money somebody brings in. That's one thing. That's easy. And that's the most rewarded thing. If you're bringing in money, it really doesn't matter what you do. You can be saying the most idiotic things uh, imaginable, but it doesn't matter as long as you could find a granting agency to fund your sayings, particularly if it's the government funding them. That is seen as the most prestigious. Well, the other thing is impact factor. Uh, deans will look at, well, this, is, this guy has seven articles in high impact factor journals. That must mean he is good. Again, with no understanding of what's going on of the value of the worth of something. And for p people who try to sneak in and make a criticism of a field, uh, not just uh, people carping from the sidelines, absolutely ignorant criticism. No, I'm talking about informed, intelligent, uh, real criticisms that should be answered, uh, that have genuine questions, make good arguments. I mean, w we can't just have anybody saying something. It's not the credentials of somebody who's making a criticism that are important, but the arguments they are making. These sort of things are attacked viciously, um, almost sadistically. As, as Berlinski said, scientists react like uh, pigs when they're stuck. They start squealing and screaming, and they don't take criticism well at all, and they don't want to hear of it. Um, this is seen not just in global warming, but it is seen in physics, it is seen in medicine, it is seen in sociology, it's seen absolutely everywhere. Um, here's Berlinski again uh, on this subject, and then we'll wrap that one up and move, move on to uh, cheating. Let, let's be reasonable. We're all sophisticated men and women here. I mean, the, the, the popular myth of science is a uniquely self-critical institution, and scientists as men who would rather be consumed at the stake rather than fudge their data. I mean, that's, that's okay for a PBS special, but that's not the real world. That's not what's taking place. I mean, people fudge the data whenever they can get away with it. Uh, and they, they will uh, commit themselves to fraudulent drawing just so long as they're convinced that no one's looking over their shoulder. And it's, it's unrealistic, unsophisticated, and unwise to expect people to do anything other than that. But we do, though, don't we? we we're, we're back to the beginning of, uh, of clericalism, of sidolatry, of treating scientists as our secular priests, of those who are holier than us, of those who would not deign to cheat or fudge or uh, amplify uh, evidence in their favor and turn a blind eye to evidence that uh, is against them. No, that stuff just can't happen. These are scientists. Look at them wearing white lab coats and looking authoritative. This stuff, of course, is ridiculous. This doesn't happen. Scientists uh, are, are just like everybody else, and uh, th although some of them have a greater intellects than other people, that just means that sometimes they're able to do a better job, and it sometimes means they're more clever at cheating. Cheating is on the increase. Cheating, as Berlinski said, uh, people will fudge their data, and it's happening with increasing um, frequency. So here is uh, one particular well-known case. This, this is the editor of science, the then editor of science, Don Kennedy, describing one incident. The journal Science has received and reviewed the summary of the report from last night of the Seoul National University Investigating Committee that has been looking into two papers published by Dr. Huang and his colleagues in South Korea uh, in science in 2000 and 2004 and 2005. The findings 
involve serious research misconduct, finding that both papers contained fraudulent data and fraudulent conclusions. Well, this was a guy named Huang he's talking about who did some cheating in stem cell research, stem cell research and cloning. And that was a particularly fecund field for fraudulence. Uh, and still probably is. There was another famous uh, woman, uh, Haruko uh, Obokota, I don't know quite how to pronounce her name. It, any, any flashy new field is ripe for cheating, uh, particularly where there are statistics involved or data is involved where uh, they're not made public knowledge and people can massage and smooth them over. Um, they don't cheat in the same way these, these medical scientists, the sociologists cheat. They, uh, sociologists cheat just by asking bad questions. These uh, physicians cheat by actually fudging their data. And it's becoming such a big problem, cheating. There's even a site called Retraction Watch, retractionwatch.com, and you can look this up just right now. Um, you, you go onto the site right now, and you can look at this right here. So this is just today, uh, prompted by Pub Peer, biologist corrects three papers. Uh, conservative political beliefs not linked to psychotic traits, a study claim. There's a whole slew of those papers we've looked at on the blog before. Anybody who holds a conservative view is uh, somehow deemed as uh, devious or, 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 or uh, demented in some way by academics who can't figure out how anybody could believe differently than them. Here's another. Another paper by Duke Pair with 12 plus retractions is flagged. Author pulls four papers from Surgery Journal for plagiarism. And these are big things. These are not minor journals. The, the problem is, and we've talked about this before, in our democracies, our great democracies, which uh, must pay for all of these studies, uh, it was seen that everybody should have an education. Everybody should go to school. Everybody should go to college and university. And that led to uh, an, a great increase in the number of universities and colleges from the 50s on to our period. And that increase in college and universities led to an increase in the number of professors. After all, they had to staff them. And since professors must publish and, or perish, every one of these uh, pro uh, professors had to start writing something. And they had to do research, quote, unquote, research. And that led to jealousies uh, from, from those groups who were not scientists in the literature and the humanities and so forth. They had to have theories and research and so forth. Most of those were, of course, nonsense. And that led people to uh, further worship science. And th that led to more research money being given to science and more papers put out. And you cannot keep expanding a system and hoping that that system is going to provide you quality work. It just doesn't work this way. You, it's the expansion team syndrome in sports. We've talked about this before. If you add new teams to a professional sporting league, the new players can't be as good as the old ones, and it's the same thing with universities. We have too many of them, and they're dragging everything down. At least the mean quality of research is degrading because there's too much. Journals appear almost weekly to hold all of these papers and there's too much being published and so science is watered down and more and this has the effect too of taking the time of those superior researchers and scientists who must at least have some passing acquaintance of everything what's going on so the entire system uh, becomes watered down and this is an enormous problem and there's no way I think to fix it I, I think I read uh, one uh, blog post somewhere out there that says the NIH has uh, funded over 27,000 primary investigators those are current ongoing studies all those studies and that's just the primary investigators all those studies cannot be worthy and that leads <laughs> to nowhere and that leads to the end of the show now you can trust me on this everybody because i am myself a scientist and therefore everything i say must be true uh, join me again next week when we'll talk about statistics <laughs>